This is the Optagon, my custom wearable computer and teleprompter, as well as the only one of my projects to appear in every one of my videos. It's really old, really busted, and could fall apart at any second, so last November I set out to build its successor. Suddenly a single snafu stopped me where I stood. When I unplug one of the displays, the other one shuts off too. That one innocuous bug turned out to drag me through 10 months of reverse engineering, micro soldering, laying out circuit boards, and ugh, talking to people. At the end of the tunnel was the single stupidest circuit board I will ever build. Lady cyborgs, gentlemen cyborgs, and regular cyborgs, welcome to the first actual hardware hacking on my hardware hacking channel. Welcome to Void Star Lab, where it just ain't hacking unless there's a hacksaw. That last episode's title, which will appear here and here, is not just clickbait. The Optagon 1 is based on the Epson Moverio BT200, a video headset released in August of 2014. I'm recording this in October of 2022, and my whole recording workflow hangs on its single fraying cable. I've been puckering so hard the toilet looks like a failed print. Last time I found the perfect upgrade, the Epson Moverio BT40. This is the same product line as the BT200 with a similar see-through display, except four generations newer, lighter, and easier to read. I only wear one-eyed heads-up display, it's self a video length rant, and while the BT200 just continued to work after I amputated the right display, the BT40 was not as forgiving. Our problem is simple, unplug the right display and the left display shuts off. Our mission is simple, make it not do that. The outcome is simple, and uh, the thumbnail in fact already spoiled it, but trust me when I say the end was just the beginning of the end, which should begin near the end of the video, but I need the end product to reach the end of the video. The point I'm trying to make is that the whole Optagon 2 project is done, making this the very first episode to feature my brand new wearable computer. This plot twist has been brought to you by Polycam, the app that turns your phone into a 3D scanner. If you can snap a picture, you have everything you need to copy and paste real life objects into your favorite CAD program or game engine. Just hit record, orbit your phone around the victim, and watch as Polycam automatically captures hundreds of shots from every angle. Polycam's mind-melting math uses the magic of photogrammetry to reconstruct an honest-to-goodness, fully textured 3D model complete with ambient occlusion, normal roughness maps, and even fully dimensioned floor plans you can virtually fly through. If you have an iPhone Pro or iPad Pro with the LiDAR sensor, it'll add precision and resolution, but any phone camera or even camera camera can get great results. You can scan anything that'll hold still long enough for you to walk around it, from animals to people to sandwiches and even buildings. Share an interactive preview with anyone, even if they don't have the app, or export your work into Fusion 360, Unity, and pretty much anything else with a Z axis. Visit the link in the description to get your first Polycam scans for free and download my 3D printable 3D head. I'm aware my real head is already in 3D and you're watching this video in 2D, but shut up. So why did I scan my head? Well. Well, the original Optagon is mounted to a pair of counterfeit glasses that I bought from a shady busker in front of this exact Trader Joe's. If you wanted to make your own tough tendies. This time I am transcending glasses altogether by making the entire frame 3D printable. You don't need anything except a 3D printer and you know the Moverio itself and what we're going to build later in this episode. I'm not much of a sculptor but using Polycam I could capture my cranium and the BT40 and just design around them. Is this some Tony Stark shit or what? But before we get to work on the frame, we have to slice the thing in half, and in order to do that, we gotta shut off whatever's making it shut itself off. So put on your jacket, because it's time to hack it. That was less lame on the heads-up display. Everything's cool on a heads-up display. Hardware hacking is a wonderland of deep wizardry. We're talking firmware extraction, side channel attacks, even the occasional liquid nitrogen and fuming nitric acid. I do not know how to use any of that, but I'll let you in on a dirty secret of not just hardware hacking, but all hacking. The best techniques are really dumb. I started by conducting open source intelligence, which is elite hacker speak for searching Google. Turns out Epson doesn't just sell off the shelf video headsets. They've packaged their micro display technology into a component called the optical engine module. 
Maybe it has a data sheet that will give us some clues about the BT40. It's not like they would just rip the guts out of a consumer product and sell it as a module. Allow me to introduce the Epson Vision Module 40. It's literally the guts of the BT40 headset sold as a module. If you think I'm being uncharitable, allow me to show you some products that implement it. The Georgian J7EF Plus, the X-Vizio Sear Lens 1, and the TMVA SE800. Believe it or not, this isn't even in the top three laziest engineering decisions in this video. All developer kits have developer documentation, which means there is a combination of keystrokes that will make Epson give me instructions on how to hack their own product. Let's see if we can figure them out. I signed up for a developer account and you notice that the juicy stuff is locked behind their evaluation license agreement. Component manufacturers, especially ones who make high-end proprietary stuff, often require an NDA just to get a basic data sheet, so I played along. The information wants to be free, or is it their only Crime is curiosity. One of them is the hacker creed, the other is the motto to the movie hackers. I promptly received an email, but it wasn't an NDA. It was an Epson employee asking how many thousands of optical engines I expected to procure. I explained that I am not a multi-million dollar manufacturer. Aha, they said, you must be a hardware startup. Send me your business plan, road to market, and contact info for your multi-million dollar manufacturing partner so we can ask them how many thousands of optical engines they expect to procure. So I clarified that I was offering a trade. I give you a free sponsored video for my three 350,000 subscribers, I endorse your product and every piece of content forever, and I create a whole new category of wannabe cyborgs who want to buy Moverios. You give me PDFs. It was an offer that no one could refuse. They immediately refused. The automatic shutoff, I was told, outside of any expectation of confidentiality, can only be disabled by custom firmware. And if you think we're gonna give some schmuck with no multi-million dollar purchase order, single nanosecond of developer time, you can curb stomp a bucket of Legos. I'm paraphrasing. I was locked out of almost everything. <laughs> I couldn't download drivers, I couldn't look at their sample code, I couldn't even buy a VM40 dev kit, which I will remind you is half of a consumer product I already own two of. They even locked me out of documentation for another product that I wasn't even interested in. I don't know how the hell it ended up here in the first place. Without the license, I could only download three files, a sales brochure and two sets of product specs. The brochure was worthless, and the product specs were mostly redundant, containing little beyond every piece of information anyone could possibly need to blow this thing wide open. Functional diagrams, pinouts, register maps, control flow, product numbers for every chip and every connector. They handed me the recipe for the secret sauce and then spat in my face when I asked what's in the french fries. It turns out Epson's micro displays are this kind of cursed hybrid of Elcos and OLED that quickly burn out at 70 Celsius. So the interface board dims the display if the panel hits 65, triggers an emergency shutoff at or above 70, and if one of them fails to respond, assumes the worst, and hits the kill switch. That explains why this obnoxious feature is more important than literally a million hours a year of free advertising. I soothed my impotent rage by impulse buying an infrared camera, and uh, sure enough, heating a display to 70 Celsius has the exact same effect as unplugging it. It's important to note that the headset itself isn't triggering the shutoff. Epson themselves admitted it was firmware, and even if they didn't, the patch notes of one of their most recent firmware updates do. As we discovered last time, the headset doesn't have anything that runs firmware. It's just an FPGA and CPLDs. So the culprit is the STM32 microcontroller on the interface board. That gives us a point of entry, the tiny mezzanine connector that connects the two. The pins on these connectors are only 100 microns wide, spaced a mere quarter millimeter apart. Far too small to probe or break out without risking destroying everything. But if I could buy copies of the connectors, I could make a breakout board, and what do you know, I had a PDF with every make and model right above the pinout. They should have taken the free advertising. We are going to design a circuit board to slip between the headset cable and the interface board. We're going to intercept the communications between them, and once we disconnect the display, replay them. The interface board should have no idea it's even missing. This is called a replay attack, and you often see it in mod chips, like the Notorious MM3 for the PlayStation. This replays the authentication sequence from a real Sony game disc, which lets you run the homemade personal backups you legally created under 17 U.S.C. Section 117, Paragraph A. 
The interface in question is an I squared C bus, a simple protocol that lets a central controller send commands and request data from many connected peripherals. By giving each peripheral a unique address, dozens of parts can be controlled with only two wires. The Moverio has six of these wires because it has three separate I squared C buses, one each for the left display, right display, and light sensor. This enables Epson to give both display modules the same addresses, carving seconds, literal seconds off the manufacturing process. I wondered what would happen if I just connected the left and right buses together. I think I actually mentioned this in the last video. I might be able to just pipe the left side's output to the right side. See, I totally did. The risk is that if both of the interfaces ever talk simultaneously, they will talk over each other with unpredictable results. This particular microcontroller can run the I squared C interfaces directly off the RAM in parallel with the CPU. Since Epson deliberately picked this chip. It's a safe assumption they're, you know, using it. I decided to stick with the replay attack. So this is what I designed, a flexible printed circuit board to slip between the headset and the interface board with the exact same connectors as the real thing. This is the first flex PCB I ever made, but it's not intended to be bended. Flex boards are about 1.6 millimeters thinner than fiberglass boards. The joke is that most fiberglass boards are 1.6 millimeters thick. You can laugh now. I ordered these boards, bought the parts, and commissioned some laser cut stainless steel stencils to deposit a precise amount of solder paste on each of these tiny pads. But even though the stencils are just four thousandths of an inch thick, they still let too much goo pass through. That excess paste formed bridges that were barely visible even under a microscope, and the tiny connectors and ultra-thin board rendered every attempt to rework it a round of Russian roulette. If I hit it with the hot air reflow gun for one second too long, the connector warped and I had to start over. If I brushed the iron against the connector, it warped and I had to start over. Then I had to repeat this with the other connector on the other side, and I couldn't use a stencil for that side, and if either of the connectors warped, I had to start over. But I did it, because I love you, in a Costco kind of way. With the I squared C broken out, I could finally hook up my minty fresh logic analyzer and look my white whale right in his Moby dick hole. First, the boot sequence. If a display fails to respond to any of these commands, the headset won't boot. Afterwards, the interface board requests a temperature reading every second or so, and if a display module fails to respond, the headset will retry four times before shutting both of them off. When I move the solder jumper, it breaks the I squared C lines between the interface board and the right vision module, and connects them to this here at Mega 328, the same chip as the Arduino Uno. I have a lot of these left over from old projects. This thing is programmed to respond as if it were all four peripherals on the missing module, which you can do. The Moverio uses 1.8 volt logic, but I had to feed the at Mega exactly 2.6. Any more, and the 1.8 volt logic would be too low to count as a high. Any less, and this chip will not run fast enough to keep up with 400 kilohertz I squared C. In my infinite wisdom, I put my super special 2.6 volt regulator on the bottom side of the circuit board, and the mod chip wouldn't snap into the socket. Womp womp. I stripped it off and wired it up to a breadboard, and as I did, I realized I had put pull-up resistors on the I squared C lines to 2.6 volts. If I had been able to power this whole thing up, my $560 video headset would have suffered a magic smoke decompression event. The only thing that saved me from my incompetence was my other incompetence. So I nixed the pull-ups, I moved the regulator topside, and I broke out the left and right I squared C to more sensible positions. These dotted lines mark where to cut. Once it works, I can shear off the headers to fit the chip inside the clip. I also put some dank memes on my silk screens. Does this taste salty to you? I painstakingly populated the V2, flashed the firmware, installed it, and it worked! Ish. The Arduino would receive and acknowledge write commands, but every read would fail. I compared the right display, which was under my control, with the known working left display, and I immediately saw the issue. Clock stretching. An I squared C peripheral is supposed to stay in lockstep with its controller, outputting one bit of data every time the controller raises and lowers the clock signal. It's sort of like how an elected official is supposed to have the same interests as their constituents. But the Atmega, like our gerontocracy, is too old and too slow to keep up. Like a boomer desperately strangling any form of change, the Atmega tries to tell the controller to slow down by overriding its control of the clock line. But the 
Alverio CPU, like a Zoomer coming of age, was not programmed to obey the lowest common denominator. It immediately reads the data line, sees an unexpected lack of response, and considers it an error. I just got a low battery warning. This isn't sloppy coding. Epson's peripherals don't use clock stretching because they're actually pick components fast enough to keep up with what they're trying to do. So why would their code support it? Clock stretching is a physical part of the Atmega's I2C hardware, like the self-serving pseudo-morality burned into a politician after 40 years in power. It, it can't be fixed, it can't be worked around, it can't be adjusted, it can only be removed. I went back to the logic analyzer hoping I had made a mistake, but no, uh, fossilized brains really are stalling societal improvement, and the right interface's clock pulse is way too long. But then I saw it. Something I said I'd see was nowhere in sight. Once I realized I couldn't see it, I couldn't unsee not seeing it, and suddenly, I saw the solution. I squared C traffic was flowing between the left display and left interface, the right display and the right interface, but never at the same time. I said if we connected the left and right buses, both interfaces would eventually speak simultaneously and cause random wackiness. But as I combed through days of data, dozens of boot attempts, I did not see this happen a single time. The Moverio would talk to the left display and then the right display every single time. Epson picked a microcontroller that could run both displays simultaneously and just didn't. A handlebar mustache erupted beneath my nose and I twirled it in one hand as the other reached for the soldering iron. I shorted left serial clock to right serial clock and left data to right data. I unplugged the right display, I gave it the juice, the left eye turned on, but it just stayed on. That's it. I'd, I'd solve the problem. The interface board boots up the left display, then it thinks it's booting the right display, but it's not. It's booting the left display again. Bamboozled. It reads the left side's temperature, then it thinks it's reading the right side, but it's not. It's reading the left temperature again. Hornswoggled. The left display itself is spoofing the right display, and it can do this because Epson gave them the same address. The Arduino is no longer required, so I cut it. There's nothing left for the regulator to power, so I cut that too. There's no signals left that I need to sniff, so I cut the headers. And that leaves the bottom connector and the top connector. And that's it. At just 10 by 11 by zero, oh no, we're out of power. Oh no, it sucks to be you. Yeah, we're out of juice. Do you like the hot swap battery? At just 10 by 11 by 0 0.1 millimeters with two whole components, the third and final Optagon mod chip is not just my smallest, stupidest circuit board. This is my smallest, stupidest project. I told you dumb hacks work. It was too small for a stencil. It was not fun to assemble, but I got the material and the moral victory. Epson's rep was wrong. I didn't have to touch the firmware. In fact, they can't actually disable this hack using their firmware because they didn't give themselves any way to tell which display is which. There is actually a way for them to tell, but it would be deliberately trying to attack me in particular if they do it. Oh, I'll be so happy. I laid out three circuit boards. I soldered 100 micron pins under a microscope. I haggled with mega corporate lizard people. I have gone through so much bullshit, and it's all to bring us to this single perfect moment. I came. I saw it. I came again. <laughs> Only thing left is to make this display wearable, so I invoked the power of content marketing. I enlisted the only professional makeup artist I've ever married to give me a hipster ass man bun, mattify my face, and just scan the shit out of it. This let us get a perfect scan of my nose, ears, forehead, and just overall handsomeness. The results need a little bit of massaging to make them watertight and printable, but I got what I needed. Thanks to Polycam, I have officially open sourced my head. Make a marble bust. Examine my phrenology. I'm augmenting reality over here. Make me regret this. I imported my noodle into Fusion 360 and hold on to your pecorino because I'm about to bake your ziti. I traced out the Optagon's arm, following my head in the BT-40 in a sketch. 
a 3D sketch. That's right, this little checkbox is your red pill out of the two-dimensional plane, letting you loft, sweep, and spline in three mind-melting, crash-provoking axes. I ran off iteration after iteration, tuning the arm shape, frame thickness, mounting surface, nose placement, until I arrived at what I thought was the final design, until it broke, and I had to use the second last design. The frame glues or tapes directly onto the lens, reusing the spring-loaded left arm. These two little teeth counteract the shear force that would otherwise twist the two apart. This little plate clamps down the Moverio's nose bridge. It's actually quite comfortable and comes in a number of sizes. Finally, I added a hinge because you gotta know when to fold them. Filament printers struggle with these kinds of flowing organic shapes, so once I was satisfied with the design, I ran it off in resin. But enough is enough. I was minutes of finely gluing and platonic screwing from saying the sweetest words of all. This project is done. The Optagon 2 has smaller optics and a larger picture, which lets you see more of my face while I see more of my script. It's more comfortable since it's, you know, custom fit to my skull. But the best part, you can finally download the Gerbers and STLs to make and mod your own. Instructions coming soon. I want to be absolutely clear, this is a very difficult project that needs serious experience, tools, and cash just to fabricate. But the result is, in my objectively correct opinion, the only heads-up display worth wearing. And remember, the BT-40 is just a display, so the next thing to make was the built-mounted Optagon 2 brain box. It's got the high-powered Codis Edge V from the last episode, a hot-swappable camcorder battery. Would you look at the time? Guess I'll have to save it for the next episode. So hit subscribe and ding that bell. That takes you within smashing distance of the like button, and since you're already in the comments section, you might as well at this point, right? Thank you so much for watching. Polycam, thanks for sponsoring. And Epson, thanks for nothing. But most importantly, thanks to my patrons, like lab scientists Jonathan Frazen, Rodeo, and Lord Robert E. Wilde. Our most generous collaborators and lab assistants have usernames that constitute, in the words of last episode's sponsor, a legal liability. So I've included everyone from the last episode here. Our collaborators are Schleppy the Schwagster, Creality Online Store, Brian D. Swollen Nut, Command, Jeremy Arnold Schweddy Vag, Karen Houseman, Caster the Catboy, and Chuck Faduk Small Dong. I've hidden their names throughout the episode, and last episode's names are still in the last episode. The lawyers missed the Easter eggs. Our inimically appellated collaborators encompass Max Luck says, if you can't fix it, you don't own it. Bum Tickly 69, Nomad Grant, Talon Democratic Socialist and a Pretty Righteous Dude Dash Sack, Bab Stabbington, Ethan Gomes, Little Bobby Tables, Iron Rain, Cameron Swords, Rusty Flute, Vicarious Nerdgasms, Azundo Wielder of Iron Heater of Shrink, Post Poop Zoomies, Ryan Guler, Someone is at the Donation Door, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Kyle Fisher, Michael Roche, Brad Cox, Boulder Creek Yard James, Danny Devoid of Life, Bill Schooler, Zanforian, Zosh, <laughs> Kevin DeGraff, Isakai Elf, Mahiro Chan, Desine, Piri Klotz, Onyx Plague, The Benevolent Misanthrope, Oral Netta, Bubakiss, SXP, Amanishi, My Dog is a Bear, The Cuddle Fish, Burn It, Cat603, Hank Scorpio, Powerful CCH, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Sucky Sucky Long Time, One Handful of Beans, Eddie, Trucku, The Letter Z, Ashley Coleman, Scroto Sagans, Lydia K, A Corn, Granville Schmidt, Callsign Carrot, Gary Duvall, Bob Dobbington, Nathan Johnson, Ghost of Bradstormer, Steven Six Foot Six Figure, Six Pack Schulte. Michael Dempsers, Good Suck, Verka, Lord Anorak, Zoistra, and a bunch of other stuff, Burn Duck 3, Protagonist, Storm B Design, A Very Fine Dumpster Fire, Thomas B. Myers, Sunburnt Cat, The Antifa, Trans Rights, and Trump Did Nothing Wrong. Let this unlikely alliance show there still exists a force powerful enough to reunite a shattered nation, giving me money. I'll see you in the future.